my immediate left uh, is Yegbun, Yegbun uh, Zhugov, uh, who has a lot of uh, experience in project management, financial analysis, research, uh, acquisition uh, around climate finance. And she works now as, as a coordinator of Climate and Clean Energy Coalition, and you're based in Paris. That's correct. Uh, next, Yegbun is Ademola Deschanel, and we call him Demi. Demi is the CEO and founder of <coughs> Resource Energy. Uh, they specialize in generating energy using small uh, standardized solar hybrid systems. Uh, which they install in the premises of uh, uh, individuals and uh, businesses, and uh, the model is what Demi calls uh, power for service, which I'm sure we're going to hear more uh, about later. Uh, to uh, Demi's left is uh, um, Mike Mason. Mike Mason, I think, is most famous for being one of the co-founders of the world's first uh, carbon uh, market, uh, uh, climate care, which is a carbon uh, trader, it? trader. trader. Uh, carbon trading uh, organization. Uh, in 2008, market care was bought by JP Morgan. Uh, Mike Merson is now involved in uh, a source of uh, investment, uh, but also startup companies looking to really solve the issue of energy crisis in Africa with particular emphasis on bioenergy. And then to the extreme left, we have uh, Ishmael Dodo, who is uh, a Lloyd African Fellow from Oxford University and currently a Regional Strategic Oversight Advisor to the Office of the uh, Secretary, Assistant Secretary General uh, uh, at the, uh, in New York, uh, UNDP New York. So um, we're going to proceed a bit more informally. I will uh, ask them to each uh, throw more uh, light into their background and what motivates them, and then we will then roll more into their organizations, the services they provide, the opportunities they see, and the challenges that they face. So Yegbun, we're just going to go from my left to, 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 to the end. Could you just tell us a bit more about yourself? Sure. Well, first of all, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you to the organizers to, for inviting me. So my name is Yigbun uh, Gürgöz. It's a difficult name to pronounce. It's a Kurdish name. I come from Turkey, um, and I immigrated with my parents to Paris when I was um, nine years old. So I come from the city of light, Paris. Um, I work as a consultant for the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, um, the Secretariat of the Coalition is hosted by UN Environment in Paris, and I coordinate there the Finance Initiative and the Household Energy Initiative. And I'm happy to give you some more details, uh, maybe on the Coalition, the work that we are doing, and also the details of our um, work in Africa, um, after the other speakers maybe introduce themselves. Sure. Um, my, my name is uh, Ademol Adeshino. I am um, a Nigerian by birth, uh, but grew up in the U.S. I spent the last three years um, founding and building a company called Rensource. Uh, Nigeria, a country of roughly 200 million people, more or less, um, uh, generates about as much power as Heathrow Airport uses every day. And that problem um, has, has presented a very large opportunity, um, you know, both for government to you know, step in and address and also for private players like myself to, to exploit to some extent. Um, before Rensource, I was uh, mostly an investor, um, investing in, um, in agriculture, energy, and other kinds of assets and focus in Africa. Okay. And what connects you uh, with uh, Mike is that actually you also worked at JP Morgan. This is right. Yeah. yeah before Mike. Uh, and really? At the very beginning, yeah. Um, okay. So you don't need to know much about me as a person, but let me tell you what, I, what I'm really passionate about. That has been successful in Africa because it is so good and so affordable and it solved a problem. The reason we have problems with energy in Africa is that we actually, I believe, don't yet have the right products at the right price in the right places. 
So we're working on developing some new technologies. Um, one of which is looking at the bits of plants we don't eat, rice straw, maize straw, and so on, and also some radical new hyper-water efficient crops. There's a group of plants, maybe 20,000 species, that we've never exploited commercially, agriculturally, which use about 10% of the water that our normal crops use. And of course, Africa is desperately short in many places of water. So we're looking at turning those into energy, turning them into energy affordably, undercutting the price of fossil fuel energy. I'm also looking at solar. Um, Demi's looking at solar hybrids at the domestic level. We're looking at it at the national level, using dams and solar as a combined hydro station. We just finished a piece of work for the government of Kenya, funded by the Foreign Office, um, showing that we could put 350, maybe 450 megawatts of solar alongside their dams and operate them as a single power station. Um, Mike. That's it. Oh, okay. Ish, <clears throat> Thanks very much. Um, you can call me Ish, but give me some smile. You guys look so serious. <laughs> <laughs> very intimidating. <laughs> um, I know this is Oxford, but still, please, let's <laughs> chill a little bit. Um, so my name is Ishmael Dodu. You call me Ish. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to be sitting next to Mike. Um, Ten years ago when he or more when actually we met, he, he taught me in one of the classes when we're talking about carbon trade. So it's, it's quite a journey to be sitting next to him. He's still very passionate. Um, at the moment, I work for the, uh, for the Assistant Secretary General and head of UNDP Africa. And previously, I was working for the UN Secretary General. And one of the key roles that I played there uh, was helping to set up the frameworks for the implementation of sustainable development goals. Uh, in particular, uh, when we talk about energy, um, I also helped to manage the Secretary General's high-level panel uh, of some heads of states and CEOs and so on, on what we call the Sustainable Energy for All. Um, so I'll be very happy to, to share a bit more about those, um, you know, the initiative of the Secretary General and the world, where we're going globally in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals um, and what energy, the role that energy played. Um, in ending, I just want to say that uh, one of the analyses that is very clear is that you can never drive human development. You can, you can never achieve inequality, social justice, um, and ensure that there is you know, a broader uh, share of development dividends if the issue of energy is not placed at the center of it. So it's, it's very reassuring to, to come and you know, be part of this um, uh, debate. So some of you, including Fiona, have already touched upon it briefly, but I still want to conceptualize what is the energy challenge in Africa and what is your organization doing to break the mode and in what is the unique thing about what you're doing? <coughs> Thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, mention the report that has just been released last week, which is um, the Energy Atlas for Africa. That's a joint publication by uh, UN Environment and the African Development Bank. And you'll find there that, um, and these figures can be challenged, of course, 30% uh, of the energy, of the final energy consumption in Africa is from biomass. Um, and that's where my work comes in, actually, because um, over 3 billion people in the world still cook their food um, with wood or charcoal, which is detrimental to the climate, of course, but also to people's health, and especially women and children, because these are the... Um, ones that spend most of their time, well, first fetching for the food, uh, for the for the wood, and also for cooking, of course. And in Africa, especially because in the first years of their lives, babies spend their time on the back of their moms. Um, and so, the organization I work for, the coalition, uh, has set up a household energy initiative that looks at improving, um, you know, tech, improved technologies for cooking and also for lighting, uh, to save premature deaths and to improve the health of populations. And we do also very specific work in Africa. Um, the coalition is a voluntary coalition that started uh, five years ago. It was a seminal report from UN Environment looking at short-lived climate pollutants. And these are, well, methane, black carbon, which is the particulate matter that is emitted from incomplete combustion of wood that goes directly into the lungs and um, you know, provokes all the respiratory diseases and lungs cancer and um, all these diseases. 
and so uh, in five years, I would say, the coalition grew from five members to now 110 partners. Uh, we have 50 countries among these um, partners. Uh, we work very closely with Nigeria, which is a very active uh, partner in the coalition, especially looking at moving away from um, kerosene subsidies in Nigeria, um, looking also at uh, improved technologies for cooking, and actually um, our work is also closely driven by uh, the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves, and so we're looking at mainstreaming these black carbon and health considerations into the whole work of the coalition and of the, uh, of the Global Alliance. That's a little bit in a nutshell what we are doing. Very clear. Demi. Um, you know, the way I conceptualize the energy challenge in Africa, in particular Nigeria, where, where I operate and where I know the best, um, is obviously that there isn't enough of it, um, enough powers, not enough power is being generated, um, that which is there is unhealthy, it's um, expensive, and extremely inefficient. Um, where Rensource tries to, or how Rensource tries to address that, um, is by really, you know, moving forward with a vision of an Africa where centralized generation isn't, um, you know, as prominent as it is now. Um, you know, my point of view is that the same way that um, Nigeria and the rest of the continent has really leapfrogged um, centralized telco infrastructure. Um, the same economics, um, the confluence of pricing, technology, government um, will drive that same kind of effect in energy. Um, you know, we are just one segment of it. You know, we're, we're focusing on sort of consumer level small business systems. Um, but there are other players doing, pursuing the very rural so-called bottom of the pyramid, um, white industrial space, um, the many you know, you know, you know, small scale utilities. And I think um, the point of the matter is that um, all of these will work together um, and, um, and really you know, need to kind of play their own roles. What Rensource is doing, we're, we're largely pursuing what I would call um, you know, or describe as you know, one to 10 kilowatt peak, two and a half to 10 kilowatt hour of storage systems. These are not dissimilar to um, a Tesla Powerwall, um, something some of you may have heard of, um, but focused on, you know, on Africa, on Nigeria. And because of that, there's other technologies we have to add to it to make our business model work. One, these systems are still quite expensive for someone to own, to buy outright. And so because of that, we don't actually sell them outright. We allow people to pay to use it. Um, to manage the inherent credit risk, we've got to be able to control the systems, monitor how they're being used, you know, when they're being used, which appliances, um, to secure them if a client doesn't pay. And all of that kind of feeds into kind of our business model and our operating model. Um, we, you know, a lot of the economic model behind what we're doing, this sort of so-called pay-as-you-go, is not innovative. You know, other companies like Copa, B-Box, um, Off-Grid Electric have really pioneered this space in Africa the last five, seven years, but very much focused on the very you know, sort of bottom end of the market. Um, we are pursuing you know, the mid-tier, um, and you know, one of the challenges we've had up until now is that the technology hasn't been where it should be. Uh, meaning there's been a very active supply chain for that bottom end. But if you're looking at, you know, to use my example, an average consumer in, in Lekki or the mainland of, of, of Lagos, um, they can't go buy a Tesla Powerwall. Um, yet they have largely the very similar um, energy needs in terms of what, what they're powering their homes. Um, but where we've seen the opportunity is that when one actually tries to implement any kind of energy efficiency techniques, um, you can really make a big difference. Let me give you an example. Um, it's quite common for homes, um, in Lagos at least, to have water pumps, um, um, to sort of pump water into their home every day. Um, one of the most expensive elements of what we provide right now is storage. The solar panels are actually a commodity. My panels are no different than his commodities or her, or her, commod or her um, panels. Um, but the storage is still quite expensive. If one can simply um, you know, tell or program the water pumps to, to pump during the day when the sun is out and shining, as opposed to during the evening when you're using, it, using energy from the, from, the, from the battery, that makes a huge difference in terms of the actual quantum of energy you're able to provide and store. Um, little things like that actually add up quite, you know, um, into quite, um, quite a bit of impact. And those are the, the kind of techniques we're implementing to, um, to you know, grow our business and, and, and affect the impact. So this is why you call it power as a service. You don't actually sell this 
machines, but you install them in yeah. the premises of your clients. Yeah, so we're basically deploying small power plants in individual homes, individual businesses, and allowing people to pay to use it. Um, you know, that accomplishes two things. W one, it's often unaffordable for a customer now to buy the systems outright because we're investing in batteries which are quite long-lasting. Mm. Um, but two, it also aligns our interests with our customers, meaning if my system's not working at their homes, they're not going to pay for it. And because of that, we need to have a robust service infrastructure you know, to be able to respond to them, install it properly, audit it properly. Um, and that's a lot of kind of you know, the difference between us and a trader who is sort of selling it and leaving. Um, and that's why we call it power as a service. Brilliant. Mike, I know you started already. Carry on from where you started. OK. But you asked the question, I think, where do we see the problems? Yeah. And let me give you some real world examples. I'm working at a different scale to Demi, so I, we're up at the scale where we interface with government. I wish I wasn't. We built an anaerobic digestion plant, which is Africa's largest grid-connected plant in Kenya. It took us two and a half years to get the permissions that you get in the UK on the internet. We built it with private finance because no one would lend, because we couldn't get the permissions to build it. And then when we built it, the politicians said, oh, all right, you might as well have the permission. The problem we have is a governance problem, first and foremost. I've just done a pe two pieces of work in Kenya. One, going to your point about water storage, looking at, in a much bigger scale, exactly the same thing with Kenya's dams, where what you can do is you can use solar in the day, the dams are short of water, they've lost 25% of their water flow over the last 40 years because of ab agricultural abstraction and so on and so forth. So we can use solar in the day, store the water behind the dams, and release it at night when you need it. And nobody has actually responded to the report which is sitting on the minister's desk. What's even worse is that when we did this, there's a very complex series of dams down this river, and we did some really sophisticated modeling and demonstrated that you could generate 50% more energy out of the same water by managing them differently. This is free money, and they still haven't responded. So I'm not saying that these are the only problems, but by heck if you sorted those out, you would get a long way very, very quickly. So I see governance as a major issue. And I want to go one step further here, Chucks. So the work I'm doing at the moment is looking at some really exciting research, which is most appropriate, really, to Africa, which is about taking vast areas of semi-arid land and using some of them productively. For example, 1% of Tanzania's land area, not very much. Irrigated, well, you've got Lake Victoria, Lake Tanganyika, Lake Rukwa. How many bodies of water do you need? Grown maize, where you've got twice as many growing days as the Germans have, and let's even assume we're growing it half as efficiently as the Germans. We could produce food for a large proportion of the population. The agricultural waste would generate as much electricity as the entire national grid today, and the solid waste from that actually would produce enough charcoal, which combined with energy-efficient stoves would replace the entire charcoal need of the country. But it's impossible to get anyone to grasp anything visionary. Even, I have to say, he isn't here, I hope, the African Development Bank, when the World Bank asked me to go and look at this and see if I could offer some imaginative solutions to a program that was being run by the AFDB, and they had a really boring set of, well, we'll do what we did before, plus a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of the other. So I came in with this. And the AFDB said, well, the World Bank may have appointed you, but we're firing you because we don't want to be quite so exciting. Heavens. You know, Africa can leapfrog. You have the opportunity to be an energy superpower. You've got sunshine. You've got water. You've got agriculture. You've got land. You've got all of the ingredients that are needed. And you haven't got the baggage of a 19th century electricity distribution system. You could be an energy superpower. Only if someone wants to be an energy superpower. And I don't have a sense that anyone really wants to be. Ish. 
<clears throat> do you want to speak a little bit into that and maybe focus specifically on this issue of governance, but also what role that uh, multilateral institutions like the UNDP are playing to, to help address that challenge? Right, that's, that's a very good, good question. Um, I'd like to approach this um, uh, from, from a very human point of view. Uh, the reason I'm wearing glasses is not just genetics, but because I spent uh, in my formative years, I have to, I have to learn uh, using what is called, um, we call it in our language, or sono, I don't know if you do, but it's, it, it, you know, you, 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 it's weak, and because there is no power, um, and I had to prepare for exams, and I was very, very, uh, I was quite studious, um, like to compete, like to do well in school. Um, I will wake up at night and just uh, use that, uh, and you'll have all the weeks into my nose. And I, at one point, I went to school, um, writing exams, and started coughing, um, and, and developed asthma, and so on. And so in my formative years, I, I learned um, without electricity for most, most part of the time. And so it's, it's, it's gratifying that I'm here uh, under light. And if you want to test why energy is, is such a human, human development issue, it's let's lose your cell phone, put off the light here, try and remain in darkness for, uh, you, know, you know, look for light to do something and then you understand what people are feeling. So it is really a universal access to, to energy. It's really an important ingredient for transforming not just the human capital, but transforming the whole nation. And, and this is why the UN um, took it upon itself as part of a critical part of achieving the sustainable development goals is to place energy, uh, sustainable energy uh, for all as, as a centerpiece. And what we try to do um, is, is work with government to do what we call diagnosis, to understand the, the energy uh, problems that they have, the, the kinds of energy mix that can solve the problems, um, and, and then link them possibly to finance. I think the issue of governance is really, really critical. And Donald said that you cannot talk about African growth without addressing the issue of governance. Uh, and I, I think that it is, it is a critical part of, of everything else. Uh, you have a situation where um, even when you mean well, one way or the other, some politicians will block you. Now, how do you address this issue? Um, there, there are a variety of ways where the UN do this. One, to engage government on, to talk about some of the bottlenecks of, of governance issues uh, with civil, civil societies, with different, different players, and to try to push the boundaries of creating a space where you can have uh, transparent conversations about, about key issues. There are other shuttle diplomacies that we also do, uh, which is you know, talking to uh, leaders of particular ministries, ministers, and so on, in behind closed doors to try to, to, to push certain issues that are very critical. Uh, but I might say that uh, the, the issue of governance is, is very challenging to address. Uh, the, the way that the future holds for this is um, to see very progressive leaders actually taking reins of power. Um, uh, it is something that I mean like to, to dwell, dwell on more because essentially yeah. it's a question of leadership. Um, can, I, can I push you a little bit more please, on push that? Me. So I'm you, trying to be very diplomatic, but no, I'll you, come. You home. interface quite a lot with government yes, yeah. and, and leaders, as you say. So what do you find to be the main problem? Is it that they don't know what to do, or they don't want to do it? There are a, lot, a number of issues. Um, you will see that a lot of the problems that we are dealing with now, even in energy, is multi-sectoral, right? To uh, use Mike's kind of scenario, scenario. To, to answer that question. Um, it, it's multi-sectoral. So you have one, one, depart, one ministry which is looking at the issue differently from another ministry. Mm. Um, and both ministers of state perhaps do not even talk to each other at all. So if you are in the center of trying to solve problems, then you, know, you don't only are saddled with trying to harmonize a country's national policy, mm. but brokering peace between two individuals that should not be actually be wasting your time at all. And that is the problem that you find in most, uh, most countries. It, it is the fact that um, there, is, there is a lot of difficulty to try to broker mm. anything that is multi-sectoral. Mm. 
when you have different um, leaders who are looking at things very differently. Okay. It's a problem that needs to be addressed. Another question for you, which I will give you time to think about is, what can we learn from the few transformational leaders in Africa? But while you're thinking about that, Demi, share with the audience what is your most important challenge and how you are seeking to address that. Right. And that would be also your question, yeah. Um, I have lots of challenges every day. <laughs> um, but before I, I, I dive into that, I just wanted to make my own little point about governance and leadership. I think Nigeria, as an example, does not have a reputation for stellar governance. Um, but from my experience in the last you know, three years operating in source in Nigeria, I've actually found government to be you know, quite progressive and forward thinking in what they want to do around power. I think perhaps because of how much of a, well, how obvious of a problem it is in terms of holding back the country, um, I've seen more real, you know, genuine and equipped leadership along those lines in the Nigerian government than perhaps any other sector. And so I'll just make a little, a little um, plug there for, for what's happening there. Um, you know, with regards to challenges on the ground, I mean, you know, on one level, solar is new in Nigeria. Um, it's not, you know, um, it's not, it has not yet been taken up. It's still brand new, so there's an educational process. Um, but I think if I had to pick one challenge, it would probably would be management expertise. Um, you know, there's been this, um, you know, this talk of the reverse brain drain and lots of um, Africans who would otherwise be in, in the West going back to, the, to, you know, to their home countries. And that's definitely happening. But I still think it needs to happen more. Um, you know, I think when, when, I, when I think about, you know, the things that keep me up at night, it's really having, you know, my senior leadership, any one of them, leave the company mm -hmm. and having to reinvest in the time um, to train them and get them up to speed. Um, so I would say management expertise has been, has been a challenge. Um, and then, you know, I think just, uh, yeah, educating. In, 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 in certain parlance, we'll say capacity. Yeah, capacity building, okay. um, for sure. Yeah. Um, I think that would be what I would, I would focus on. Yedwin, what is your main challenge that you're facing? I mean, in many countries in Africa now, clean cook stove is, you know, there are loads of brands in the market. Why aren't these being taken up? as much as you would want to see? Um, that's also a very good question. Um, dissemination of improved cook stoves and heat stoves, for that matter. I mean, there have been development programs trying to do that ever since the 70s, and I wasn't even born then. Um, so when I first came to this field, actually, I was uh, wondering why do people don't want to go the um, a step further and try to have electricity for all, right? That was my thinking. And then I realized that um, until we get there, there's, there are lots of things that can be improved in the daily lives of people, in the households, um, health, etc. And so what I've seen from the past programs is that um, adoption is a challenge. So uh, finding the technologies that fit the needs of the households, of the cooking and eating habits is a challenge. But from my own perspective, because I've been working in the field of financial inclusion for many years now, I would say access to finance is a big challenge too. Um, and also for what we call the bottom of the pyramid, uh, even this, this technologies for at the household level, it's not always easy to access them. And for that, they might need some you know, microfinance also. And we do work with, um, with a small microfinance institution in northern Nigeria from Adamawa State. It's called Standard Microfinance Bank. And we're basically helping them investigate if, they, if the beneficiaries would rather go for pay-as-you-go models like yours, or if it would be um, easier for them to access what we call traditional microfinance, so a very small amount of credit. And in many instances, the programs that have worked well, actually, are always accompanied with uh, some sort of technical assistance. So people go on the field and speak with the women and um, with the households and with the kids and try to um, accelerate the adoption of the um, clean technologies. Okay, I'm happy to take a couple of uh, questions from the audience at this stage. Um, yeah. Chucks. Chucks, there's one here. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Just a quick introduction of who you are, and then yeah, there is um, my question. name is Yeni Asagid. I'm um, leadership trainer and coach. 
It's a general question. I, I, I'm not an energy expert, but you mentioned um, a special kind of diplomacy initiative that is needed, and Mike was mentioning governance. Um, I worked for a long time in civil society, very long time. And um, my question is, is it still time for diplomacy? Aren't we done, done with that? Isn't it about time to say, no, you have to do this? Um, I work with um, young graduates who graduated from the first Pan-African University in water and energy. It's called Pawes, it's out in Algeria. They have actually four campuses. Um, my biggest frustration is that these 26 graduate students who are amazing went back to their countries and there's no support. Um, how many Skype calls have I had? How many calls have I had to try to find a way to even get through the door because the security guard doesn't let them in because the secretary doesn't pass their phone? It's so frustrating. Right. And I, get I, it. I get it. I get it. I get it. Yeah. So, so in a, in a, what is the role of a civil society and how can they be better mobilized and be able to challenge the current status quo and engender better governance? <coughs> is, that, is that a fair summary? Okay. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Wolf Reed. I'm a DPhil student here in oncology, so I'm not really related to energy. But uh, my question goes in the same direction as uh, our delegate here. It's uh, about um, so um, we have the we have the sustainable development goals, and we have put energy at the center. And uh, just recently, I was talking with some friends, and I I was. Uh, amazed how we, we have these goals, but I was wondering if it wasn't possible to have uh, an independent policing initiative. So that is an institute uh, set up maybe by the UN that will actually force the governments to, uh, in, in, like, to go forward with the initiatives and the goals that have been set in because we have the SDGs, but very few countries in Africa actually made it through the MDGs. So what do we do? And uh, so in the, in the same direction, how do we overcome the government challenge, especially for us as youth? Like she said, the graduates who are interested in bringing innovation in the energy sector, how do we go about doing it? Do we just have to set up private companies? Or, yeah. Yeah, there are two questions there. Uh, the, the role of policy, but also how do we work around policy? Uh, yes? Um, thank you, my name is Mukobe. I'm from South Africa, I'm studying at Bath. Um, Demi, I just want to say I'm very excited about the flexible approach you've adopted to your business in Nigeria, and I'm hoping that hopefully at some stage there will be some scalability to uh, uh, much of the country. Mike, I find your assessment quite problematic and simplistic. Uh, in fact, um, the green energy discourse is not an uncontested terrain, and therefore a rejection of certain views shouldn't be reduced to failure to grasp their potential benefits, but maybe being confronted by an alternative angle. And I'm saying this because in South Africa today, there's something called independent power producers who are currently at loggerheads with the national utility, and mainly because renewable energy in South Africa accounts for less than 4% of the total uh, energy generated, yet accounting for 18% of the operational cost of that very um, uh, national utility. And it is the cost, uh, that is an actual fact. Now, the cost of renewable energy products and their operationalization in the continent, or it, let me not even say in the continent, just restrict this to South Africa, because that's all I know. Unless there is indigenization and local manufacturing and everything done humanly possible to make sure that the final product is accessible by the broader masses of that particular country, renewable energy remains not feasible in that particular country. But also, the climate change justification for cutting down on um, a traditional forms of energy, uh, that discussion would be entertainable in my world if the whole world was cooperating. Now, how do you tell South Africa with almost half of the world's coal, if not close, to stop using coal and adopt technology which is 10 times 
the cost of what is currently existing despite fiscal uh, uh, ramification for that development country. I, I think there is a bit of, I think the discussion is a bit more complex than the simplistic uh, failure to sign a document by a minister or anybody like that. And most importantly, this discussion is not uncontested and I think we must treat it as such. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's take, uh, well, let's allow the panel to deal with that. Uh, and then we can take another round of questions. So, Yekun, uh, do you want to start? And then we just go uh, sure. across the room. Um, so the first question, I think, was on the role of civil society. But you don't have to answer all of them. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's um, actually the right one, I think, for you to, to do. Really? Yeah. Because yeah. I was going to jump to the last one, actually. <laughs> um, no, I wanted to react to the climate change justification but just by saying that you know the um, African nations don't have to make the same mistakes as so-called developed nations on the use of coal and non-renewable energy. That was my my reaction to what um, Mukabe from South Africa said. Um, and on the role of civil society, of course, there's a uh, there's an immense role to play, especially in in changing the narrative also from uh, from Africa, I would say. And I would add to this the private sector as well because um, there's a thriving um, private sector also from the continent. And I don't think that, uh, actually that holds true for, um, I would say globally, uh, we can't achieve you know, SDGs uh, without the private sector. If we only count on governments to do the work, I don't think that we will be taking very bold steps. So that's my reaction. Brilliant, Demi. Um, I'm not sure if any of the questions I'm actually I'm not qualified to answer, but um, what about the, low, the uh, scalability? Um, well, you made a point about ind indigenization um, a moment ago, which um, I find a little troubling. So I, I, it's not clear to me that um, pushing for you know an entire box or an entire ecosystem of of, uh, of actors to all be local is the most um, viable way to solve some of these energy problems. If you look at even the West, like if you look at an iPhone or you look at um, you know, a fancy Italian handbag, it's rarely the case that all the components of that handbag or iPhone are made in the US or in Italy. And I think it's, that's almost the case in, in any kind of universal example of products these days. They're bits and pieces coming from different parts of the world being brought together, integrated, and then distributed. But and isn't I think there a risk? Uh, in, I think I hear his point. Isn't there a risk that Africa will end up being Again, a consumer of green technology from the West, I, if there is no emphasis to indigenize this technology. So I think there's a distinction between ind indigenization and innovating. So let's use um, mobile payments as an example. Um, most of the relevant <coughs> mobile payment technology that came together to you know, give us M-Pesa um, M M or M-Copa and M-Pesa you know, were not built locally. I mean, they were you know, integrated and found and sought and applied um, to the, the relevant situation in, in East Africa. And because of that product, new innovations were built on top of it, which have now driven, went into, gone into energy, gone into you know, consumer financing, et cetera, et cetera. I think you'll see the same thing happen in, in, in energy, in renewable energy. Um, um, to give a, as example, you know, my customers in a few months will be able to download an app literally an app, um, to get power. Um, because we're operating in an environment where solar isn't um, a luxury, it's not something people are doing because it's green, it's actually economical. Um, there's a lot of things we can do um, that are not, that are purely based on economics um, and are thus likely to grow and thrive outside of any government subsidy or social um, rationale. I think you'll see innovations come from you know, in that angle less so from just, you know, forcing people to produce or manufacture locally, uh, because I don't think that's economical. Okay. Mike. Cool. I don't want to lose <laughs> sight of the first two questions, because I think they're more important than the second one. The first two questions, I'm going to be very quick, they are fundamentally versions of the same story. I don't believe you can do this exogenously. I believe, and this is perhaps where indigenization is really important, that the civil service, as custodians, the guardians of the gatekeepers to the minister, need to have a sense of ownership of the problems. And my experiences are terribly limited. You know, it tends to be nearly all East Africa and mostly Kenya. 
But no civil servant ever got fired for not making a decision. You get fired for making the wrong decision. So there is a fundamental culture of risk aversion which makes it difficult for people to say, here is a really exciting opportunity. It's never been tried before. Let us become world leaders. Instead, they wait for someone else to show them that it's been done a hundred times before and it's utterly safe. And that, you know, I see this screen here which says Africa is a green superpower, question mark. That's the culture that I think we have to overcome. We have to, in Africa, and I see myself in a sense as a white African, as, many as, there are, as much as there are black Britons here. We have to actually embrace risk and excitement and a willingness to be world leaders, not to be world followers. I want to come now to the somewhat misguided comment about South African energy. It's crap. The energy I was talking about in Kenya is free. You don't get anything cheaper than free. That was just bad thinking, bad, bad modeling, and a bad understanding of how to coordinate two different departments. But if you go beyond that, solar in Kenya is a third of the price of the emergency diesel that they're putting in, and at a price that we think of as likely to be sustainable, which is about six or seven cents a kilowatt hour, it's cheaper than coal. So which bit did you think was 10 times as expensive, please? I mean, we have to nail this now. Green energy is not more expensive. It has been more expensive, and it had to go through that transition to get to the price point it's at now. Europe and the States, but largely Europe, bore the burden of carrying it through that period of expense. Africa can now exploit the fact that it is cheap. So don't give me the absolute rubbish that it's 10 times expensive, please. Thank you. OK, quick comment, <coughs> because I want to go around at least right. one more time. Right, uh, there, there were some questions that uh, relates to broader global policies issue that um, I'd like to tackle. Um, I'd like to borrow Donald's words to, since we are in Oxford, I want to be less diplomatic and be very, am I allowed? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll, uh, the, the fact is, if you quote me anyway, I'll deny you. So don't. Uh, uh, so uh, the, the, the question about you know you in a, in, a, in the classic world where you have transforming transformational leaders who are very progressive, when you bring in an innovation, an idea, something that will grow the country, that would lead to larger impact. You'll be the first to be absorbed, you'll be the first to be hailed, and, and you'll be the one that you know, everyone will be talking about, and you, you feel welcome. That is the kind of world we want to have in, in Africa, where uh, talents are actually encouraged. Um, but that is not what we have. We have a situation where there's a lot of ineptitude among leaders, and the current <coughs> crop of leaders we have either don't take decisions, are not interested in their decisions, or uh, they you know, they, they want to do something just, just to show that um, uh, they will win another election as a member of parliament, or if you want to come to them, unless you want to go to their locality, they are not going to support you. So you find a situation where, as a young person, you, go, you, you get to a country and you have, you know, like this, the example you gave, you have wonderful ideas, um, and you have doorkeepers and gatekeepers who will not give you the opportunity to go. Now, how do you address this. I raised, we raised this, this issue with a, a group of uh, uh, young ministers, uh, finance ministers recently, um, in, a, in a very informal discussion. And one of the things they said was, there are often uh, a frustrating moments for those who are knocking the door, because actually where you get the traction is with the, the guys who are doing the work at a technical level. So don't, don't go looking for a minister of state. Don't go looking for a chief director. Build your network, your relationship with someone who is at a technical level. So for example, if you, if you go into a particular country, the first person you need to know is who are those who are working in research and analysis and policy within uh, the, that particular unit? Who, are, who actually influences the chief director or the minister of state? But there are people that you always walk by. You don't, you don't, regard, but they are the ones that will make things happen. You build your net network with those people. The other thing you also need to do is sometimes, is, and is, I'm just reflecting uh, uh, practicalities, sometimes going through um, you know, academia in the country is very, very useful. And other times going through um, the structures like the UNDP offices where you share 
this information with them. Building relationships with them is also very useful in opening the doors. So yeah. these are some okay. of the things that Mike, I want to do. Yeah. Some insights for you. Uh, let's collect another round of questions. No more than three this time. Okay, I'll give it to one, two, okay, three. One, two, three, and four. But make it very five quick minutes. question because we have just five minutes more. Yeah, my name is Ade. I'm, I'm a student at the Blavatnik School. Um, I, pr proud to, uh, you know, graduate studies, I worked in East Africa for um, an energy access company in Tanzania. Um, so my question is really about the um, some of the innovations we've seen in the in the clean energy sector, uh, uh, particularly in East Africa. Now you're seeing a lot of funds pouring into clean you know, clean cooking, cook stoves, and also the pay-as-you-go model, you know, and all that. And it all seems like, you know, it's it's not a bubble that will go bust anytime soon. You know, like you find just recently, the uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance said in 2000 and, 2000 and last year, like about $200 million poured into that space. So my question is, like, are we, are we, is this a bubble that will go bust soon, uh, you know, with so much money pouring into the space and a lot of pressure on investors to demonstrate that, you know, the business model really, really works? Thank you. Thank you, Ade. You can, you can actually give them to make, make it more efficient. Yeah. Thank you. Julia from Costa Rica. I'm sorry. From Costa Rica. I'm from Durham University. I'm not from the energy sector, so be kind. Yeah, the question uh, very quickly. We have four yes. minutes now. So um, I know that China is investing in a road for extending the trade between uh, the region, and it's starting by Africa. And the Chinese government is also investing, like, and acknowledging the potential of the renewable energy sector. Do you believe that this uh, relationship might increase the interest of the governments in re the renewable energy sector? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll end with you, sir. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, my question goes back to governance. Isn't it the case that the, for the average African bureaucrat, the regulations in terms of anti-corruption, procurement, and so on, have created what I would call decision-making paralysis. I would agree with Mike. If you take a decision, you're in. You rather, the safest bet is not to take a decision. Second, question is, if all the Oxford-educated, Harvard-educated, Princeton-educated young people are not going into politics, and they are very happy to discuss what is wrong with Africa, how do we see a change being made? Thank you. Okay, and I'll give you the opportunity to ask the last question. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really curious about uh, Demi's, your model as well, uh, around this idea of a centralized power distribution as well as the personal or private you know, generation for itself. How do we get uh, people to pay their electricity bills and actually support infrastructure development when you're introducing rooftop solar, you're introducing the other things that are sort of in competition with that? Sure. Okay, no more than... Two minutes. We have just <coughs> eight minutes more. So enough for two minutes each. I'll start with Ish. Very quickly. Um, I like the last point about uh, getting progressive leaders, uh, young people getting involved in politics and getting involved in leadership. Um, it, for me, I think that this is the way to go. If we pace ourselves and give ourselves five to ten years, um, and this morning the presentation we have, we had a if we put them together, we're talking ministers of health, ministers of education, ministers of transport, and these are all wonderful innovation, innovative ideas that we, we have on the table. If you imagine those innovators are the cabinet ministers who are actually taking a decision in a country, the tremendous growth that you're going to, to see is, is interesting. But my challenge to you is how many of you, between now and the next five to 10 years, are thinking to become presidents or ministers of states in your country, or you are scared? That is the challenge. That is one of the issues that we need to discuss here as well. You're not talking about African Oxbridge Democratic Party? No, not really. Right. <laughs> right, so I would agree 100% with Ish here. I have had some inspiring conversations and met some wonderfully talented Africans here at dinner last night and speaking around the place today. I just wish you were there. Because if we could take the talent that is here and apply it there, most of my problems would start to crumble. Thank you. Demi. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one of the gentlemen um, was asking whether I thought Pago Solar was a 
was, was in a bubble or you know, had too much money flowing at it. I think um, you'll probably see one or two companies fail and you know, fail pretty spectacularly, but I think for the most part, there's a fundamental economic rationale for what they're doing. Um, you know, what's, I think where the gap between you know, what people think is happening and reality is that I don't think you know, providing a 20-watt um, you know, solar system to a very, um, you know, the, the bottom of the pyramid um, is energy um, access. I think you're providing a few appliances, and that's, it's better than not having anything. But that's, I think it, you can't correlate that with actual development. I think the quantum of power you're getting is what's correlated with development. So I think that, that is a gap there in terms of what's happening and what's, you know, the impact on the ground. And I think there was another question around, um, um, oh yeah, about, about whether or not, um, you know, by providing solar home systems, we're, we're preventing people from investing in infrastructure. So my clients wouldn't buy my systems um, if the grid was working. There'd be no need to. Um, so I think um, along those lines, um, you know, we probably are going to compete a bit with the, the distribution companies and so on. But you know, we're tiny. You know, we're a small fish, and we, we would be, you know, squashed um, if they were relevant and if they were they were doing their job effectively. Um, but I know what you're saying. I think there's a it's a bit of a you know chicken and egg. Um, and right now, the consumers who care the most about what I'm providing are people who don't have adequate grid power. Uh, well, just a, a, just a comment from my side on the um, solar pay as you go. There was a Bloomberg uh, Energy report actually this year. Um, looking at the growth of the sector, I totally agree that it's a challenge. Um, so I would just finish on this note that, you know, we will probably see also the bubble somehow deflate. Right. Well, on that positive note, we'll bring the uh, panel discussion to a close. Thank you very much for your contributions and engagement. Thank you.